Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides me. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that we can be together today. Please remember that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're always welcome to worship with us here at Wilton Congregational Church. I'm Reverend Ann. I'm the senior minister here at WCC. And in this worship service today, you'll be hearing from our Minister of Christian Formation, Caroline Ainsworth Hughes, our Director of Music, Eugene Sorotkin, Baritone Paul Schmidt, our own Joni Wallace, and our choir. They will be providing our music today. As you can tell, our worship is a little bit different this week. Our sanctuary is getting a new roof, and so our organ, our piano, and all of the AV equipment are wrapped up and protected. So each of us has recorded our own segment and sent them all to Eugene, who's put them together. Thank you so much, Eugene, for doing this for us. Did you know that this past Tuesday, April 21st, church member Adrian Offinger had his 100th birthday. Many townspeople joined in a birthday parade that went by his house, and thank you so much to church members who organized this parade and others who participated in it. And thank you too to those of you who sent cards and letters to Adrian. Happy birthday, Adrian. Also, Caroline Hughes has her birthday on Sunday, April 26th. She is not turning 100, but happy birthday, Caroline. Have a wonderful day. Most of our staff is working from home, as you know. Please continue to keep in touch with us. Send us prayer requests. Give us feedback. Let us know how you're doing in these challenging times. Email the office if you're not getting our weekly e-news or if you're not on Realm. We want to keep you updated during this uh, pandemic time and 
those are the ways that we're doing that. So please contact the church office if you're not getting that information. We continue to have Zoom gatherings, our Tuesday morning Bible study, our Friday afternoon meditation session, and lots of offerings for our children and young people. If you would like to be a part of those gatherings, just let the church office know and they will send you a link. Please know that you can continue to support our church financially through electronic giving or text giving. You can also mail any giving that you have to the church as well. We are so grateful to you for all of your support. Let us now worship God together with joy. Well, this is one of my favorite parts of our worship service because this is our children's story, a time for me to have a conversation just with our kids. So if you're a young person at home and you're working on some stay-at-home Sunday school stuff, come a little closer and take a break because this is a conversation just for us. For the past few weeks, Reverend Ann has been saying our church has left the building, and this week so have I. I've traveled up to a place I love to come to, and it's a good week to be talking about travel because we're thinking this week about pilgrimage. Kind of a weird and long word that we don't use very often, but if pilgrimage makes you think of pilgrims, you're on the right track. Those are the people who traveled a long way to go to a special place, and that's kind of what a pilgrimage is. It's when we go on a long journey to look for God or go to a sacred place. Usually you need a lot of supplies and maybe a backpack. And some pilgrims from our Bible stories are Moses and the Israelites when they were looking for the promised land, or you know about the Magi, the wise men who went to go look for the baby Jesus. Well, right now, we can't go on very far trips and we can't go on long journeys, but we can think about movement and trips and time in our lives that are still sacred, still times that we're looking for God. Could a walk to the mailbox be a sacred pilgrimage? Could a walk around your neighborhood with mom and dad? or some time outside with your dog, I think we can find new ways of finding holy and sacred moments, even right where we are at home during this coronavirus. So I wanna hear about those stories. I wanna share those with of mine with you too. Let's keep thinking about it, let's keep talking, and I can't wait till we're back together again in the not too distant future. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that no matter how far or how short our journeys are, that you are with us on them. Thank you for our siblings in Christ who are separated from us, but we know that we are gathered with today as we worship. Thank you for those who went on long pilgrimages so that we might know you better through their stories. We can't wait to add ours to them. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this week comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Let us listen together for a word from God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still looking sad then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have taken place. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and they did not find his body there. And they came back and told us that they had indeed seen visions of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his eternal glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. 
But they urged him to stay, strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road, when he was opening up the scriptures? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. May God bless to us a hearing and understanding of this God's holy word. Would you bow your head in prayer with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations that are in each of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The prologue to the Canterbury Tales opens with the observation that when April's showers break the drought of March, people long to go on pilgrimages. Geoffrey Chaucer's great compendium of stories was written over 600 years ago. The text is in Middle English, which is nearly incomprehensible to we moderns. But the substance of his message still resonates in 2020. People long to experience the world with others, to travel, to go on pilgrimages. And this is yet another thing that the coronavirus pandemic has disrupted. This year, school spring vacation trips were canceled, and in many cases, the vacation time has turned into an extended time of distance learning and working from home. We are experiencing a closing of our world at the very time that the arrival of spring is supposed to open the world. After church on Easter Sunday, Paul and I were supposed to travel to Spain to walk a part of the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Obviously, that did not happen. And we, like many of you, have been saddened by the loss of our time away. But for me, the loss has been even deeper. I was so looking forward to experiencing the power of pilgrimage. The Camino de Santiago is a network of pilgrimage paths that lead to the shrine of the Apostle St. James in the Cathedral of San Santiago de Compostela. Pilgrims have been walking the Camino for almost 1,200 years, a long time before Chaucer. Many of them have written about the life-changing aspects of their experience on the Camino. Benedict the 16th, who was elected Pope in 2005, said this, to go on pilgrimage is not simply to visit a place to admire its treasures of nature, art, or history. To go on pilgrimage really means to step out of ourselves in order to encounter God where he has revealed himself, where his grace has shone with particular splendor and produced rich fruits of conversion and holiness among those who believe. I really love this quote because it has helped me to see that not being able to travel to Spain does not mean that I have missed the experience of pilgrimage. What I am experiencing right now, what we all are experiencing right now, is another kind of pilgrimage. I believe that God is inviting us to use this time of quarantine, disruption, and fear to bond with God in a deeper way. 
we are being offered the opportunity to slow down and identify those things in our lives that matter the most to us. We are being invited to reflect on our core values and bedrock beliefs. Our scripture teaches us some important things to remember about pilgrimage. This story is not about a classic pilgrimage where there is travel to a destination that will take days, weeks, or even months. Like the pilgrimage that we are on today. The two pilgrims may not have even recognized the depth of their journey. Their pilgrimage took place over just a few hours on the afternoon of the first Easter. The scripture tells us that two followers of Jesus are walking from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus. The distance is about seven miles, so they have a few hours to talk and reflect on what has happened over the last several days. A stranger joins them on their walk. The scripture tells us right away that this stranger is Jesus, but as happened several times in the accounts of the risen Lord, he is not recognized by his followers. As they walk together, the stranger asks what they have been talking about, and the followers tell him about the events of Holy Week and how Jesus has been tried, executed, and buried, and how just today, this morning, some other followers have seen the Lord have seen the risen Jesus. The stranger listens and then begins to teach them about what the Hebrew scriptures have to say about the Messiah. The two followers reach their destination. The day is nearly done. And so they invite the stranger in to have a meal with them and to stay the night. As the stranger breaks the bread and blesses it, for the evening meal, the two Christ followers recognize him as Jesus. But before they can speak, Jesus vanishes. Later, when the two followers are reunited with the other disciples, they tell them that Jesus was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. And I believe that it teaches us three important things about the power of pilgrimage. First, when you are on a pilgrimage, be open to what God is teaching you through the people you encounter. This might seem counterintuitive for us in a time when we are keeping away from other people. But as we see from this account in the Gospel of Luke, we often hear from God through other people. It is important, even as we are confined to our homes, to be grateful for our relationships, to pay attention to them, and to ask ourselves, how is God speaking to me through my relationship with my spouse, my child, my sister, my brother, my friend? Another power of pilgrimage is learning to let go. People who walk the Camino de Santiago often speak of diligently going through their backpacks each night, deciding what they can let go of to lighten their load for the next day. In our pandemic pilgrimage, we have had to let go of schedules, of plans, we have had to let go of expectations, let go of being together. God speaks to us as we let go. Through letting go, we are forced to recognize and name that which is most important to us. And finally, pilgrimage teaches us that God will provide. God provides always, but not in a magic sense. 
We don't just get to snap our fingers and enjoy instant gratification. Delayed gratification may be one of the more significant outcomes of our pandemic pilgrimage. The value of delayed gratification is a very common thing for God to teach. It's important to remember that God gives us always what we need, but not always what we want. God provides for us in the deepest way so that we can always trust that God will give us what we need. This pandemic pilgrimage teaches us to ask ourselves in the midst of our frustration, our sorrow, and our fear, what is God giving me in this? One of my favorite quotes by the late pastor and writer Eugene Peterson says this about the overarching message of the gospel. Listen. You don't live in a mechanistic world ruled by necessity. You don't live in a random world ruled by chance. You live in a world ruled by the God of Exodus and Easter. He will do things in you that neither you nor your friends would have supposed possible. I am seeing so many of us do things that we never thought would be possible. I have always known that WCC is a very loving and generous congregation. Let us continue with that love and that generosity, knowing that we will always have and can always rely on the amazing grace of our God. Amen. To a time of prayer, I invite you to find a posture of prayer that's comfortable for you. I invite you to perhaps let your eyes float closed, to work to deepen and slow your breath. I invite you to roll your shoulders back and down as we settle into a few moments of stillness and silence. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we begin this week in silence and seemingly solitude until we remember that when we are gathered in your name, we are gathered together and that you are among us. We give you thanks for our siblings in faith whom we miss, miss sitting beside in worship and miss working alongside in your justice work. Help us find ways to reach out to each other in these isolating days. Phone calls, letters, texts, and emails go a long way to showing love and connection even across distance. 
We pray today for those who feel alone and ask that in addition to our love, they feel your love and your presence. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are sick, those within our immediate community, and those to whom we are connected without ever knowing or seeing. Bring healing to their bodies, give strength to their worried families, and protect their caregivers. We celebrate those who put themselves in harm's way to care for others. Our first responders, our essential workers, and those in active military service. All who are being your hands and your feet in these times, cover them, God, with your care. As this time of anxiety wears on, Lord, we pray for those who are anxious about jobs, about income, about food security, and about the future. So much is unknown and we cannot hold all the questions. So we turn them over to you to hold and to carry. In our own community, we lift up the Belitzos family for the loss of Marie's brother. We pray for members of our community who are living alone and are now living separated perhaps from their family and friends. We celebrate the lives even as we mourn the deaths of Linda, Patricia, Jerry, and Victor. Our hearts are tied to their families in this season. We pray for those whose lives are particularly unsettled right now, with postponed surgeries, those who are facing recurrence of illness or, or dealing with chronic illness. And yet, Lord, in this Eastertide season where we are just steps away from the empty tomb, we celebrate new life and new creation. We thank you for the love and ministry, the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, for the way he calls us to lives of justice and love. Help us to be good stewards of resources that we might take care of each other and take care of creation. Help us to be channels of your love and peace this week. We add to all these prayers those of our own hearts, some so deep within our souls that we cannot even put words to them but we trust that you hear them all. We turn them over to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who came and taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to bow your head for the benediction. And now go into the world in peace, declaring the praises of God who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Menschen schon längst vor der Wunde. 